All right, good morning, guys. Welcome to the team. Let's get her going today. Welcome to week nine. This is week nine out of 24. A couple little announcements. Um, should have the uh, sign-in sheets on your tables. Take care of those. You guys know the drill. Uh, that way we uh, capture any new information um, and turn those in at the end. Uh, also, if um, I, I haven't said this for a while, but if you have a, 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 a smaller table in any particular day, like there's only two guys over there maybe. If you have two or three guys and you want to uh, just meet some new guys, just jump in with another table near you. It can maybe um, make it interesting and fun for you if you have too small a group. But, or you can stay there if you want to just uh, be the two of you. That's fine too. But it's, you're always okay to move around a little bit once it gets to discussion time. Uh, I want a big thank you to um, guys who served last Saturday and the team service day out at Riverwoods. And thanks to Lee Norris for putting it together. I think we had about 10 guys out there, got some work done. So appreciate that very much. So give those guys a big round of applause for helping out. Thank you, guys. We also have, um, also have some guys in Ecuador right now, I think. Um, a couple of guys from team are there serving down there. And uh, we'll remember them at the end uh, during prayer time as well. Calendar-wise, I put this in the email to you. Obviously, no team a week from today due to Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, take the morning off, re recovering from what uh, uh, tryptophan overdose. I guess that's what the stuff is in Turkey. Um, and then, uh, then moving ahead, then we'll have like three weeks of team. And then over Christmas, obviously no team on Friday, Christmas Day, or on New Year's Day. So there'll be two weeks off in a row which we typically don't like to do, but can't avoid it this year with the calendars. But I'll remind you of that in the emails and all that. So that's the schedule going forward. All right, here's our story today. Hopefully recovering from last week. I don't, th I don't, think, I don't think we'll ever have two turtle jokes again in one team morning, just <laughs> between you and me. Okay. Woman comes home from a long day at work and finds her husband uh, slumped in his favorite chair, half-empty six-pack on his lap, and he looks terrible. What's the matter with you, she says. Well, he says, I haven't been feeling very well lately, so I went to the doctor today. And he ran a whole bunch of tests. After about three hours, he comes back in and says, I'm afraid I have bad news. I've looked at all the tests, made some calls to some other doctors, and I'm sorry to tell you that you're going to be dead tomorrow. What? Screams the wife. Yeah, the husband says, so I went to another doctor to get a second opinion. He runs a bunch of, bunch of different tests, and he comes back in and says, yeah, I'm afraid it's true. You're going to be dead tomorrow. This is terrible, cries the wife. What can we do? Husband goes, well, I've been thinking it over. What I suggest is that we change clothes, put on some nice stuff, go to that little Italian place you like so much, have some pasta, a little veal parmesan, some wine. Then I got tickets for that show you've always been wanting to see. And I figured after that we'd go dancing and finally come back here and we'd make love the rest of the night. <laughs> Wife says, that's fine for you. You don't have to get up in the morning. Yeah, you know, they act compassionate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We've been talking about um, legacy uh, all year. That's our theme, legacy of a man's life. And uh, what we're talking about today is the legacy of mercy. And um, I'll describe it more uh, as we get into after the clip. But the clip I'm going to show you is the third week in a row out of Gran Torino. I just got... got fell in love with that movie, parts of it, so I found these th three clips, happened to be in a row. This one is uh, uh, Clint Eastwood's character, Walt, is a bitter Korean war vet who's lost his wife and who's about as salty and politically incorrect as you can be. Uh, his neighborhood's changing. Um, a refugee family, uh, the Mo a Hmong family, has moved in right next door. The, the Hmong teenage son tries to steal Walt's Gran Torino, his prized car, in a gang initiation, but he gets caught. Walt eventually, through a process, gets to, takes a liking to this kid in Walt's weird kind of way. And then we see a kind of different side of him emerge. So the word I want you thinking about is mercy. And uh, let's watch this little clip. What do you know about faucets? I know a lot about them. Can't decide. Jeez. I love the feet. What? Must be 100 degrees in here. Just turn on the fan. This place is falling apart. Man, where'd you get all this stuff? What are you talking about? All the tools and stuff. Well, 
may come as a surprise to a thief, but I bought this stuff, everything in here, with my own money. Yeah, yeah, that's not what I meant. I mean, there's just so much packed in here. Yeah, well, every tool in here has a purpose. Everything has a job to do. They're all necessary. Okay, so what's that? That's a post hole digger. That? Vice grips. Yeah. Wire cutters. You know, it's a trowel, come on. And there's a shears right there, and that's a saw. That's a tack hammer. You can't fool me, kid. All right, what's on your mind? It's just, I can't afford to buy all this stuff. Well, I guess even a bonehead like you could understand that a man acquires this over a period of 50 years. Yeah, but. All right, look, here. Take these three items right here. You can have this. WD-40, vice grips, and uh, some uh, duct tape. Any man worth his salt can do half of a household chores with just those three things. Anything else you need, you just borrow it, that's all. Okay, cool. <coughs> What's with that? Nothing. What? Nothing, huh? I just saw you cough the blood. That's not good. You should really see a doctor. <clears throat> yeah. Look, um, those guys were here the other night on my lawn. What about them? Just a gang. A bunch of mong gang things. Yeah, I assumed that. But what were they doing here? They were gonna take me away they were kind of pissed that i blew my first initiation yeah well you are you are a you know you want to hang out with guys like that what was your initiation supposed to be i like that clip because it kind of shows the transformation that's happening in both of those characters lives and it happens as they both begin to understand each other and show mercy toward each other. Clint or Walt shows mercy to this kid that he starts off not liking and he ends up giving him tools and trying to help him get started and the kid shows mercy toward Walt because he cares about him. He sees him coughing up blood and he knows, knows he's sick and that's a friendship that begins to develop. At the end of the day, the legacy of a man's life uh, is our theme. We've looked at love and faithfulness and strength and courage and truth and generosity. Last week, legacy of goodness. And today we're talking about mercy. I want to read, um, start with the text that's in your booklet from the Old Testament, Micah 6, 8. It's a beautiful verse, um, uh, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. And it goes, uh, He has shown you, O mortal or O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, notice this single verse starts uh, with goodness. The ancient text begins with goodness. He, God, has shown us what is good. Last week we saw that goodness comes from God and that God is the one who defines what is good. Now remember, uh, we also said that our goodness is not that which saves us doesn't justify us with God because we can't be perfectly good. Remember the Apostle Paul said, what's good I want to do, but I can't do it all the time. I need, I need help. Uh, it's God's gift of grace that saves us and produces then God's goodness in and through us. One of the people I follow on Twitter, uh, and Twitter can be a little maddening sometimes, but I follow a pastor named Tim Keller, who's pastor of uh, Redeemer Church in New York City, uh, one of the leading um, pastors in the world in terms of um, reaching cities with the gospel. Um, last week he tweeted this, the same week we talked about goodness. He tweeted out, when you realize that the antidote to being bad is not just being good, then you're on the brink of understanding the gospel. You had to think about that, but I like it. When you realize that the antidote to being bad isn't just being good, then you're on the brink of understanding the gospel. So our assumption here, looking at this Old Testament verse, is that the prophet's not talking about a kind of goodness, a kind of human goodness uh, that can save us, but rather a goodness that comes from faith, from the Spirit of God that's dwelling within us, producing that goodness. He says, and what does the Lord require? Then he uses three verbs. To act justly, 
We actually talked about this a, a few weeks ago when we talked about the legacy of courage, which, by the way, stands in stark contrast to the events that took place in Paris last week, which were acts of extraordinarily, extraordinary cowardice. Okay, We're talking about acting justly, then to love mercy, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then to walk humbly with your God. Again, in stark contrast to the view of religion held by ISIS and radical Islam. There's nothing humble about killing people who disagree with you. Okay, uh, This is talking about a different kind of understanding of God. And we'll talk about humility again in a few weeks. And by the way, one of my sons has these three Hebrew words tattooed on his chest because that's his life verse that he selected for himself. So what is mercy? Hebrew word hesed, which is translated mercy here, is a very rich and complex word. Sometimes it's translated in the Bible as loving kindness. Sometimes as compassion. Sometimes as mercy. And I want to talk about the aspect of mercy today. First, uh, mercy is a unique expression of goodness. Mercy is a unique expression of goodness. Years ago, and I think I've told this story at Team before, so you might remember it. I was living in Upland, Indiana, coaching basketball at Taylor University, taking classes at Ball State at night, trying to get my master's degree. I was single at that time. I worked as a substitute teacher in local middle schools and high schools during the day, uh, which, by the way, uh, was an experience that uh, that almost caused me to rethink my position on purgatory. Uh, you know, the, the, the Roman church believes in the concept of purgatory. I don't believe the Bible scripture supports it. But if you sub-teach in a middle school long enough, you start to maybe uh, believe in purgatory. Uh, I coach basketball every afternoon, and then I drive 40 minutes or so to Ball State for cla- three hours worth of class almost every night. So my days were long, and they were full, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a fun couple of years, but I needed to do it. So one night, in the middle of the Indiana winter, I left class at Ball State something like 1030 at night, in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, I was dog-tired, just wanted to get back home because I had to get up at 5 in the morning and start sub-teaching again. And with the snow, I figured it was going to take me not 40 minutes, but maybe an hour, hour and a half to get home in, on the small Indiana country roads. So I got a few blocks away from Ball State, come to an intersection, and my 1973 Thunderbird, chick magnet, um, stalled out. Wouldn't, wouldn't start. Sitting there in the middle of an intersection, uh, snowstorm, Muncie, Indiana, not a, another uh, person, car, or gas station in sight. I don't have a cell phone because it's 1982. I have no idea what I'm going to do. After a couple of minutes of cursing at my, I mean praying, I see another human being across the intersection, walking across toward my car. Happens to be an African-American guy with a hood pulled up over his head, and he's coming right toward my car. My first reaction is to hit the door locks. Not just because he was African-American, although that was part of it. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say because of how the story goes on. So I lock my doors. He gets to my car, and he motions to me like, roll down the window. So I put it down like an inch. And he looks at me, he goes, pop the hood. So I pop my hood and comes up, he puts it up and he goes and he tinkers, tinkers with some stuff, tinkers with some stuff. And then he uh, looks back around and he goes, start it up. And I turn the key and it started right up. He closes the lid and I holler out the window, hey, hey man, thanks. And he just keeps walking away. I never even got his name. So here's one definition of mercy. Mercy is goodness offered when it's not required. Mercy is goodness offered when it's not required. That guy didn't have to do what he did. My problem was my problem, right? He could have thought to himself, look, I'm walking here. I'm cold. I got to get home. This guy's got a car. He's warm. (laughs) Welcome to my world, buddy, right? He could have thought white privilege. Uh, That dude can freeze to death for all I care. But he didn't. He showed me a complete stranger, I think, what the Bible talks about as mercy. Now here's another definition. Mercy is goodness going out of its way to bless or help someone in a surprising way. Mercy is goodness going out of its way to help someone or bless them in a surprising way. Secondly, uh, mercy is extravagant compassion. Extravagant compassion. One of Jesus' most famous parables is in Luke chapter 10. It's known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. What's interesting is people who don't even believe in God People who never even read the Bible uh, use the phrase Good Samaritan. Many did not even know that it was Jesus who created the story that gives us the idea of a Good Samaritan. But here's the story. Let me just read it for you. Uh, I don't have it in your book. Let me read it for you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll break it down for what it teaches us about mercy. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
most important question of human existence. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, meaning he wanted to demonstrate that his own goodness was good enough. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, a religious fellow, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, this story is beautiful and it's... Um, has all kinds of surprises in it. First and foremost, Jesus is confronting this man's sense of self-righteousness. The man wanted to justify himself. He wanted to prove to Jesus he was good enough without any of God's help to get himself into heaven, to be acceptable. Jesus confronts him and says, all your goodness, you don't even know who your neighbor is. And you can't even behave this way until you receive the mercy of God yourself. Then there's a surprise that the priest and Levite pass by the injured man. They're the religious guys. They're the pastors of their day. They both have better things to do. They show mercy on this stranger. Then we see the surprise of the Samaritan, who actually is the one who stops to help. Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero in the story, which would have been shocking in his day because Jews saw the Samaritans as, as sort of religious half-breeds. They were perpetually unclean before God because they weren't pure Jews. Jesus makes this man the hero of the story. Finally, uh, we see the surprising compassion of the Samaritan man, extravagant compassion. Mercy is extravagant compassion toward the needy. He gives his time. Probably took him a whole day. He's still there the next day after he gets the man help. He shares his resources, his wine, his oil, his donkey, gave his money to ensure the man got the care that he needed. All kinds of surprises in this story. Mercy is extravagant compassion offered to those who cannot help themselves. And it comes from God. Mercy is also extravagant compassion toward those who don't deserve it, toward those who actually deserve punishment. Let me tell you another story. This was uh, uh, after, uh, shortly after, a couple years after I had this to told the story of the stalled car. It was the same year I got married. I got married in April of 1985, which happened to be the same month I graduated from seminary, which was just bad planning on my part. I, I thought I was going to be done and only have like a class or two left at that time. I miscalculated. Uh, and I was taking 18 hours uh, of seminary work. Uh, the last semester I was in seminary, we're planning a wedding. I was working 30 hours uh, a week at a church at that time in Glen Ellen and all trying to maintain this relationship. It was so much stress that I actually broke out in hives twice during that semester because I was barely sleeping, trying to get all that stuff done, and I had to go to the doctor. I had welts all over my body. Um, so in order to get all those hours in at class uh, to finish, I needed to finish because we were getting married, then we are going to go to South America on a mission experience. So I needed to finish. I couldn't put it off to the fall. So I signed up for three courses that overlapped on one day of the week. So there was one morning of the week, that whole semester, where I was supposed to be in three places at one time. Uh, thus the hives, okay? Two of these places were classes. W one was taught by a professor who didn't care how many classes we missed. So I was good there because I could do the work. I could do the work on my own. I didn't need to be in class, so I was good there. The other one was taught by a guy who had a strict policy of three cuts and you fail. This was a seminary. This is a graduate student. That was crazy. But if you miss three, he would fail you, and he was very clear about that. So that was going to be a problem. The third class was called Clinical Pastoral Education, where I had to serve at a hospital, volunteer chapel in a large hospital. It was Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove. And sometimes on this day, which I think was Tuesday mornings, there was a group meeting that I was required to be at. Sometimes there wasn't a group meeting. So every week I was walking this tightrope of which thing I would miss to make sure I skated through. 
um, it came right down to the last week or so. So I'm getting married at the end of the next week. I got all that stuff going on. I got my church work going on. And I had missed one too many sessions at the hospital. And this chaplain supervisor calls me in to his office. And he confronts me about my attendance issues. So I told him my predicament. I hadn't told anybody up to that point. I was just dealing with it. He knew nothing about it. So he says to me something like this. So you overbooked and didn't tell anyone, didn't get anybody help, didn't get any help. You just tried to skate through. Huh. I said, that, that pretty much. That's what I tried to do. He says then, you know, you know I should flunk you and make you take this section all over again next semester. That would be a good lesson for you to learn. I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm starting to sweat now. Hives are starting to come out again. Because this would have meant a complete monkey wrench in my entire life plan. I would have had to come back. I, would, I, just, it was just, I, was just, I had nothing to say because I, I did that. I was doing this. After a long pause, he goes, well, what the heck? Only he didn't say heck. He goes, what the heck? Who am I to keep you from graduating from seminary? And then he never said a word about it again. And I've never forgotten the mercy he offered me and not flunking me when I probably deserved it at that time. And it would have been a good lesson for me. As it was, it was a pretty good lesson. Mercy is compassion toward one who does not deserve it. Compassion toward the one who does not deserve it. And finally, mercy is the kindness of God. Mercy is the very kindness of God. The word hesed, which is in this um, passage, Micah 6, 8, is actually used to describe the nature of God over 200 times in the Old Testament alone. In our English Bibles, the word is most often translated as loving kindness, sometimes as mercy, sometimes it's just love or abounding love. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 103. It's not uh, printed in your notebook there. You should read it. It's, it's a beautiful psalm. And part of the psalm describes the hesed, the mercy of and kindness of God. Let me read these verses to you. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. The Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in hesed, in love. Okay, hear those descriptions? Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in hesed. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his hesed, his love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That describes the very nature of God. God is merciful. He is full of hesed, loving kindness toward us. And that mercy was revealed ultimately, the New Testament tells us, in the person of Jesus. We're getting ready to celebrate the Advent season, to think about the birth of Christ. This is God's intervention into human history. God's intervention into the brokenness of the world was through Jesus, the ultimate expression of the kindness and hesed of God himself. 1 Peter chapter 1 in the New Testament says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance, think about legacy, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Our faith is grounded in the mercy of God, not in our own goodness. In His mercy, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. In His mercy, God expresses extravagant compassion toward those who cannot help themselves. In His mercy, God provides the extravagant gift of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we receive his mercy by faith, then we demonstrate and share that mercy with others, even those who do not deserve it. And we begin to build a legacy of mercy. Here are the questions I want you to deal with around the table today. Uh, I'm going to adapt the second one and make it into two questions. But the first one is, can you think of a time in your life when you were the recipient of someone's mercy? Kind of like the stories I told. When you were the recipient of genuine mercy, describe the story. It may take a while to think about it. Secondly, here I'm going to break this into two questions. Can you think of a time when you wish you had offered mercy? When, when you had an opportunity to offer mercy and for one reason or another missed the opportunity? That's the question that's not in there. And then the last question is, can you give an example of when you might be required to offer mercy 
whether it's through work or whether it's in family, whether it's through relationships, something coming up when you can see mercy as an opportunity in your own life. So take a break, get some coffee, get some donuts, wrap you up right before uh, 7 o'clock. Come to me with prayer concerns if you have them.